Rather than being bound to a distant generation whose legacy perhaps you believe should be reserved for the history books. We urge you, however, to consider the words Lidor Bador, not as a request, but as an endless command, a lifelong responsibility rather than a burden. On the night of Kristallnacht, my family's grandfather, a blessed memory, hid in the Polish embassy in Munich and escaped to England soon after. Our grandmother, may she continue to live in health, along with her mother, she was expelled from Leipzig, Germany, to Krakow, where at age 11, from Krakow, she eventually boarded a train to England, never to see her mother again. I pledge to eventually share their stories with my now still very, very young grandchildren. And so for all of us, may we telling our past always remain part of our present and certainly part of our future. If you want to. It's been two years since our last in-person commemoration, and I, for one, am glad to be back. 84 years ago, the lives of our parents, grandparents, and for some of you, great-grandparents, were changed forever. Prior to 1939, <coughs> Their lives were somewhat enjoyable and stable. They worked, socialized, attended cheder or gymnasium, celebrated chagim, married, and had families. Following September 1939, Krakow was made capital of the general government. The persecution then began. Jews were required to wear armbands. Around 40,000 people were expelled from the area. The ghetto was established in 1941 in Podgorzy. 15,000 of our people were forced into an area previously inhabited by only 3,000 people. Starvation and disease became the norm. Shootings in the street were not uncommon. During the time between 1941 and 1943, systematic deportations took place. People were told they were being <coughs> relocated to better places. To better substantiate the sham, Postcards were written by the deportees to family members, which were probably received often after the writers were already dead. They were deported to concentration camps or to Belgians for extermination. The final liquidation, which we commemorate today, took place on March 13th. 1943. 2,000 of us who were deemed unfit were murdered in the ghetto or sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau. The lucky ones went to Kwarzhev, a labor camp. There, too, were indiscriminate shootings, typhus, and deportations. I don't have to go into detail about how they survived. It is well known that each survivor experienced his or her own show off. We are living proof of their tenacity and will to survive. Thank you very much. And now I would like to, re to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Alex Constantine. Uh, now, my name is. Can you hear? Well, come closer. 
I took a shower in the run. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the microphone. I was born, <clears throat> try to imagine the map of Poland. Poland is situated in a geographically very unfortunate area, smack in the middle between Russia and Germany. I was born in a tiny village called Varum, and it is northeast part of Poland, uh, toward the Ukraine. Now it's in the hands of the Ukraine, for sure. For how long, I don't know. Sure. Uh, and uh, uh, my parents Whatever you can see, okay. Uh, the, my, th these are pictures of uh, my maternal, uh, uh, ma maternal family. Uh, they were working for a wealthy homeowner by the name of Burka. I'm sorry, not Burka, but uh, Holinka. And Holinka was not just an employer of the family, surprisingly enough, he was a friend of the family. And we had very cordial relations with him. Now, and my father <coughs> was a flower merchant, F-L-O-U-R. And uh, uh, he, he used to buy flower from a farmer by the name of Ulka bring it to a mill, put it in various, various uh, sizes of bags, and distribute it. Business was good. We were kind of a better, well-to-do well family of a village which was populated by Jews, but very destitute, very, very poor. Uh, now, Interestingly enough, my father used to, when he ventured into the larger city, he used to buy gold, gold coins. Now, gold is a commodity which we think about now, especially about the recent bank, uh, implosion uh, comes to my mind that maybe it's a good idea to uh, try by. Uh, my mother was a, as all the young ladies were, she was a housewife and uh, I was born September 1st, 1937. Now, uh, my poor mother gave birth to me. I say poor mother because I was told that I was about, about a 10 pounder. Uh, so, and she dedicated herself like any good mother does uh, to uh, raise me to the best uh, of her ability. Uh, she had uh, three brothers, and all of them worked for Kolunka. Now, September 1st, 1939, the sound of cannon were heard in Poland. That was in honor of my birthday, World War II broke out. Now the Germans conquered Poland in record time. Um, unbelievable, because Poland is uh, well, 
this is Poland is a large country. Polish people are good fighters. Yet the country collapsed suddenly, like like a lightning hit. Uh, the Germans were were organized, have had the equipment, and blew the soldiers away. Our lives didn't change much. We were so geographically insignificant that the Germans, I suppose, didn't bother that much with us. They were, I suppose, we didn't know that, I, I just speculate. They were taking care of larger Jewish communities. Yet, we were, an uh, order came out that we have to wear the Jewish star, the yellow star, and whoever doesn't wear the yellow star, punished by death. Life went on kind of hesitantly, so to speak, in the shadow of the German, German Wehrmacht. My father still did business, but less. He wanted to travel uh, less on the road because it became more and more uh, difficult and, and dangerous. Uh, but life went on normally. Now, <clears throat> until 1941. Students of history know what happened in 1941 in, in uh, Europe. As a matter of fact, students of history should ask a question, how come the Russians didn't stop the Germans from invading Poland? And that's because uh, Hitler the Chancellor of Germany and uh, Stalin, the head of uh, Russia, made a peace agreement. And the huge army stood by, Red Army stood by and did nothing. In 1941, the arrogant general and they were not students of history. Otherwise, they would learn what <coughs> Napoleon had when, they, when he tried to conquer Russia. Uh -huh. Said, conquered Poland in such a, with such ease, we probably would do the same with Russia. And invaded Russia massively with over a million soldiers and, uh, and heavy equipment. The Russian, in order to slow the Germans down, were using heavy artillery fire. And the fire, the shells, many of them fell on Polish villages too. And the uh, so this, in turn, triggered a massive refugee movement away from the war, kind of southward. Uh, and this was the scene in 1941. Some refugees stumbled into our village. These were Jewish refugees. They were scared and hungry. Uh, <coughs> My parents hosted many of them, fed them, and heard the story, the same story, yet they came from different locations. And the story was, they told the Jewish community, 
members of community is gather in an open place, like an open market, and uh, told them to take two suitcases, loaded them up with trucks, and <coughs> took them away. My mother wanted to know where they took uh, these refugees who obviously escaped, they didn't listen to the German. Uh, the, they said, the Poles told us <coughs> that they took them to a labor camp. And my mother asked, which labor camp did they, who, who did they take? She wanted to know the age of people. And what, what she heard, she didn't like. They took everybody. Now, everybody didn't make sense to my parents because you don't take to labor camp women, young children, old people. So she was suspicious. She didn't know what was really going on, but she was suspicious. My father didn't know what to do. My mother was more of an active nature. She, she says to him, we cannot stay there. I would not allow them to come here, load up my family, and make us disappear. What can we do, my father said. So she said, she, he had, didn't have a plan. He knew the heavy anti-Semitism in Poland against Jews, very unfriendly country to the Jews, despite the Jewish numbers there. What can we do, he said. And so she came up with a plan. She said, well, these refugees, Polish refugees, passing by the village, uh, continuously they were passing by. We will masquerade as Polish refugees. But here you take a terrible chance to removing the stuff. And in addition, my father didn't like. Uh, now, if you look at my face, um, I have some, somehow Slavic features. So I was told. Uh, thick lips, wider nose, blue eyes, and uh, I used to have brown hair, if you believe it. Okay? Uh, my mother looked at typical European woman. Like there is a, 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 an expression, oh, he looks like an old American, right? Whatever this means. Uh, and uh, my mother was, uh, I might say, all European. If you couldn't place her whether she's from Italy or from France or from England. She, she, had, she was a pretty woman, she had straight nose, blue eyes, brown hair. My father <coughs> had an ethnic face, a Jewish face with elongated, longer nose, darker complexion, dark eyes, dark hair. And the Poles would spot a Jew from a mile, like blood. He was afraid because of his appearance, he would bring kind of danger to us. So he was reluctant to leave the village. But finally, he gave in and uh, they started preparing to leave. It was toward the end of summer, 1941, my mother prepared a bag for perishable food, 
as much as my father could camp. And the other bag she put clothing for winter, winter in Poland very harsh. And now my father, meanwhile, during his traveling and selling the flower, he accumulated quite a few coins because he, he used to buy these coins, as I said before, he didn't trust the po Polish currency, and he was right. Uh, so my mother made the <coughs> made a belt, a peasant's belt, which they were wearing around their waist, and uh, she put a row of coins on a coarse piece of material, covered with, with, with another one, piece of material, anchored it with thread, and my father was wearing kind of nobody suspects what it was. It was a heavy and expensive tool belt. And I don't remember exactly, but it was the end of summer 1941. We stepped out with my father, my mother, and myself. I am now four years old. We stepped out of the house. And we became instantly homeless. Now, my parents didn't know what they were going. Imagine that, that, that uncertainty gnawing uh, at them. The Poles, I suspect, had some destination. Some villages down south past Britain. My parents moved to nowhere. I, myself, was kind of, as a four-year-old, was happy with the situation. Um, we were, I was with my parents. We slept under the sky. When it was warm and not raining, we slept in shallow woods. And when it rains, we snack into barns. And we were progressing slowly, deliberately, with the refugee group. Now, my father was walking at the very end of the of the refugee group, uh, half of his face covered with the with, 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 with the shawl, which was suspicious suspicious to begin with because it was summertime, and some Polish women, nosy, they asked my mother, "This man is your husband?" And she said, "Yes." Why is he walking with us here? Why is he walking there all alone at the very end? My mother uh, came up with, with an excellent answer and he left her alone. Uh, she said, ah, you don't want him here. He has a contagious disease. He, he has uh, TB. When they heard tuberculosis, mm -hmm. they, they were very happy that he wasn't amongst them. And that's how we were <coughs> moving slowly, deliberately south. <coughs> now, <coughs> you can imagine that after a while we ran out of food. And then became the ordeal of securing some food. knocking on the door and begging for some food. Uh, my father offered them gold for some food. And what did you get for a golden coin? Luckily enough, if he got a boiled potato or a piece of dried up bread, that's what the gold coin could buy. Um, 
Finally, uh, it, and this is already 1942, and uh, <coughs> there was an activity on the road that we were walking, which scared our parents because Germans on motorcycles used to move around, stop some people, pick some people up, putting them on trucks, not you, both. And, uh, and then my father felt if they stop us, we, they would shoot us on the spot. And uh, so he said, we have to find some, some permanent shelter. We have gold. Okay, so again, the element of uncertainty. You knock on the door, who will open the door? A kind person, a hostile person. Nevertheless, they knock on the door. A man opens the door, immediately says, go away. Didn't say go away in Jews, he, he went, go away. Probably was bothered by uh, a lot of Polish refugees which were knocking on his door. My father was ready to, for to such a welcome. He had five coins, he opened his hand, he said, we are making here, I am making a business proposition. We are very tired from walking. Uh, here are five coins, and uh, let us stay in your place and rest for them. The man became instantly friendly, uh, took the money, took, took the coins, and brought us to a underground shelter, like a bunker, a cellar, kind of, and gave us some straw, uh, kerosene lamp, a bucket of waste, full waste, and we stayed there 10 days. Now, one night, he comes in, holding in the hand a plate, which was covered with a piece of fabric, and it smelled very good. Not like pastry. And he said to us, um, I am celebrating my birthday. My wife uh, baked uh, a lot of uh, cake. I brought some to share with you. You are nice people. And uh, uncover it. It was blueberry pie. Uh, we were very grateful, blueberry pie, uh, we, we just didn't have pastry, a piece of pastry, almost a year already. Uh, he says, enjoy and leave. Uh, my father breaks off a piece, gives it to me, breaks off another piece, gives it to my mother, and he himself begins eating. When I swallowed the first piece of this pastry, I throw up instantly, violently. And my, ma my mother too. He swallowed already, my father swallowed already, already three or four pieces. And he falls to the ground in terrible agony. He poisoned us. What was his motivation? We don't know. Cannot figure it out. Uh, we returned it so fast that it didn't affect us. But my father, who swallowed more, was in terrible pain. 
My mother rushed to him and begged him, open your mouth, open your mouth, wanted to insert her finger to make him gag. He was in such a pain, he couldn't respond. My mother lowered herself to the, to, to the dirt floor, put his head in her lap, sat there and was crying. I held on to his shirt, he was crying too. My father was very sick. And then he stopped moving. <clears throat> My mother kept crying. I was kind of, I as a child was relieved a little bit because if he stopped crying, it, to me it meant he's sleeping now, doesn't feel anything. My mother kept crying. <coughs> and then suddenly she like woke up from a and told me, we have to leave, <coughs> we have to leave now. I became hysterical. I didn't want to leave my father there and told them. He's sleeping, I said. No, we have to leave, she said. She was afraid the men will come back to see whether we did a good job. And Finish us. She felt danger. She, by force, she grabbed me. I was holding on to, the, to his sleeve, and I was crying. She yanked me out of this hall, and we ran into the field. And here is a young mother in her early twenties, trying to content with two powerful enemies. One enemy, the Nazis, we kind of fool. We, uh, well, we were Polish refugees to them. The second enemy, we cannot fool. And this is hunger. Uh, when you're hungry, you cannot say, I'm not hungry, it doesn't help. My mother desperately used to knock on doors, trying to secure some food with the gold coins. It didn't help. Maybe the peasants with themselves didn't have enough food. Finally, she, she we were so filthy. And she rubbed in more dirt into my face, told me, knock on the door and extend your hand and say, Kabbalah chleba approach. Piece of bread, please. I must have been such a pitiful young little child, such a little urchin, that I was more successful secure, securing some food. And uh, it's, and so it went on. She used she used to go into uh, at night and foraging in, in, in garbage, picking up whatever she could, putting it in her mouth, and then feeding me. And I was taking it in, taking it in, like it was gourmet food. But when you eat garbage, you just lose your strength. Interestingly enough, I never had a stomachache from it. She never had a stom stomach problems with it. eating garbage. I, I, I see it as an irony today going into a upscale restaurant, I eat a good steak and then come home with this summer okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, but miraculously at that time, it just, just didn't happen. 
some of them. And eventually, my mother fell when she came to the end of the rope. She couldn't move anymore. She sat down under a tree, took me in her arm, and was waiting to die. But suddenly, somebody taps her shoulder. She looks up. A woman stands over her and says, my goodness, you are alive. It looked like you were dead. Is the boy okay? My mother whispered to her, please, bring us a piece of bread and some water. The woman very obligingly ran to the house, which wasn't far, and just brought some bread and water and extended an invitation for us to come into her house. She saved our life, and that when she was like an angel of mercy. Uh, she helped my mother to get up, took me in her arms, and my mother leaning on her shoulder, walked in slowly to her house. Uh, there she spread a blanket on the floor, we climbed on this blanket and we fell asleep. Until next morning. Next morning, she extended an invitation that we could stay in her house to regain our strength, but we have to wash up and change our clothes. Uh, and, and she even warmed some water uh, and uh, placed, placed it in a steel tub, which they used for the scrap board for uh, laundry paper. Uh, also taking a bath, there was no shower. And uh, uh, my mother took a bath. She gave her some of her old clothing. And my mother felt absolutely thrilled after shedding all the dirt from her body. And then she said something which alarmed uh, my mother. Why don't you give the boy a, a, a bath? Look, look how he looks. And my mother said, no, thank you. I, 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 we will go now. We, you were so gracious to us. We don't want to overstay our welcome. We will leave. The woman didn't want to hear of it. She was very focused on me, and she explained to my mother why she was so concerned with me. She had a boy about my age, who she said laid on the dirt road where the German trucks used, used to pass by. Uh, found a grenade, pulled the pin, and then ripped him apart. He died. So she was very focused on me. Uh, my mother finally gave in. I got undressed, and uh, my mother was shielding me with her body, kind of, because my mother was convinced that she thought we were fully dressed. She wants it, she didn't want her to see me. Look inside. I climbed into the same water that my mother bathed herself in, and yet the woman noticed. She smiled, said, I will come back soon. Walked out, left, left out some clothing of that poor boy which was a little too large of me, but it 
some groups who have no clothes on. And by the time I finished, she came back with a Polish policeman and said words my mother never forgot. Hateful words. Take this or shiver, shiver. You, you don't have to understand Polish, the sound of it. There's so much negativity in it. Take these leprous you out of here. Now suddenly we became leper. Yesterday, she saved our life, really. I called her angel of mercy. And today she sent this us to death, to die. And, and, and what for? I mean, Paul, so she didn't like Jews. Poles didn't like Jews. But what did a young mother and a little boy do to her? Blows me away. I just cannot understand. But the and this <coughs> irrational. He took us away, uh, and uh, my mother begged him to not to take us to the police stations. He said, uh, "I will do you one favor. I will not take you to a Gestapo station because the Gestapo station will kill you immediately." Tell you, I, I, I take you to a regular police station and you might leave a few days more. So we took us to a police station. We were walking. And we walked into a cell, a large cell which was filled with Jews from roundups in the area. My mother positioned herself sat down on the floor with myself next to her <coughs> and we were waiting. A few minutes later comes in a, another, another policeman, Polish policeman. Uh, they needed, the Germans needed Polish policemen to, for language purposes, to, to translate. And asked uh, who of you women knows how to cook well? My mother raised her hand immediately. Three other women too. And he looks around, came closer to my mother and said, I know you are lying. You are too young to be a good cook. But since you are the cleanest of these people, come with me. This, this uh, bath went a long way. So, so she took her to the, to the kitchen. My mother wanted to take me. No, he stays here in the cell. So, and she began to cook and soon found out why they, she, they needed, uh, the cook there needed a helper because the cook was terrible. <laughs> And she excelled in cooking. Uh, my wife, Susan, uh, benefited <coughs> from her cooking. And she can testify to it that she was an excellent cook. And, and, uh, uh, and, and the Germans were very impressed with it. Uh, but she was petrified what was happening in the cell. The cell, after it filled up, they used to take the Jews away on trucks, murdering them in, in the woods, neighboring woods. She was afraid that they would throw me up on the truck, and that's it. She would come one day, and I'm not there. She begged the commandant of the camp and he tried to find out, by the way, whether she knows German, and she knows Yiddish, and 
learn some German with Holinka's kids. They got homeschooling and he invited her, who was more or less her age, for homeschooling and they learned German. Now, being close to Russia, you might say, why not Russia? Well, German was considered the cultural country, no? Germany is culture language, everything culture, culture, culture. And the Russians were complete barbarians. So she, she understood German, but she didn't want him to know that she understands German. So she used to answer in Polish. Finally, he used to get annoyed, he used to call a uh, Polish guy, Polish policeman, he used to translate. So she begged him to, no, to give the, poli the policeman who load up the people on the, on the trap not to touch me. And he obliged. He was a nice father. <coughs> and uh, I used to stay there at a certain point. I was the only one left in the cell. At a certain point, they had to leave the complex, the, the police complex, maybe because of Russian troops movement, who knows. And she overheard the commandant telling his deputy in German, next morning, get rid of the woman and the child. First thing, so, so, so she's making preparations desperately to escape. Now, we, we, we regained our strength there because we ate well and, uh, and we didn't work that hard. Uh, and so, so can you imagine a door of the cell, cell? In the middle of the door, there was a, a little window. Luckily enough, the lamp was broken. On the outside of the door, there was a bar that barred the, bar the door. My mother found a little, not a little, <coughs> she, she found some wire. And at night, when the guard was far away from the, the cell, she made a loop of the wire, put her hand outside, and tried to pull and pull. And it didn't work, it didn't work, and pull until finally she opened it. She had the presence of mind to, to take the gold uh, belt and lock the door so it doesn't arouse suspicion. And we ran into the back of the, of the, of the cell. Now the end, and into the woods, and then we were stopped by barbed wire. Uh, I didn't stop my mother, she opened barbed wire for me, lacerated her hand, and it was <coughs> nasty barbed wire, kind of uh, rusty and so forth. And I crawled through it, ripped my clothing, and scratched my back while I was bleeding. And then she slowly negotiated her way through the barbed wire, ripped her clothes, and again, it scratched terribly. And we ran to the road. Uh, we looked terribly suspicious. Uh, like in the movies. So 
So it had that, that a, it was fairly early in the morning, still kind of dark. A uh, peasant with a horse in the body was passing by. My mother told him the truth. She says, I ran away from the police station. Please give us a ride so I can distance myself as fast, fast as possible from here. Please. Uh, and the man was so shocked that the woman escaped from a German station to the Poles. Eventually, the Germans were like Superman. He just couldn't deal with that. He gave us a ride. And, and, and uh, uh, eventually, he took us, told us to get off because there was more traffic on the road. He came later and he looked very suspicious, bleeding and kind of ripped clothes off. So we were hiding in the shallow woods. And at night, my mother ventured out into a village to look for some clothing on the night. There were no uh, dryers or either in, in Poland at that time. People were doing their, uh, drying their laundry on the outside. And uh, to her delight, she, she found a line of full of clothes with some la lazy housewife forgot to take off. And uh, she found for herself a, a dress. Uh, and for me, she was looking for some special dress. I mean, you cannot be that choosy. What, uh, I wonder what do you think she was looking for me? A girl's dress. <laughs> and uh, oh, when she found it, she was so happy. I put it on, and it was a little long and so forth. But for a while, I was, I was a girl. I was walking, and and she didn't want any more. Uh, <coughs> she didn't want any more problems with circumcision. Uh, my hair was long enough from uh, a year of not having haircut. And uh, my mother used to kind of joke around uh, later and say, you didn't look uh, like the prettiest girl in Poland, <laughs> but you, you did okay. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, and she, then, then she made the decision to go back where she came from. She, she decided, she knew the geography of Europe. She knew that she, if she keeps going south, nothing but trouble awaits. Uh, Romania, no good. They were allies with the Germans. Hungary, allies with the Germans. And even more so, uh, suppose a truck took her or something. Uh, Italy, for sure, allies with the Germans. So she heard from some refugees who were drifting back, not, not, not on mass like that, but single people and so on going back, that the Germans are in deep in Russia, by the way, the, 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 the first stages of their uh, invasion were very successful, and, uh, and there's no more danger of shelling the villages. So she tried to get to Burka, the man who sold the, the grain to my father, and ask her for shelter. Now, 
and the track began. And, and this is uh, uh, 42 winter. And the winter was horrible. By the way, I uh, I got scratched by barbed wire, so did my mother. We didn't have the luxury of a tetanus shot in real life. We and we, but we didn't get blood poisoning. Amazing. And then the winter hit. Tremendous snow. I didn't have the shoes anymore because I, I outgrew them. Whatever my mother found, piece of her smartness and so on, uh, and the garbage she wrapped around my feet, and we were going walking in the snow. She fell a few times into the snow. And she told me later, she wanted to stay there. She didn't want to get up. <coughs> it was so peaceful, so comfortable, she said. It first, this signs of freezing, but if it wasn't me, she would have stayed in that snow. I kind of gave her the incentive to shake it off, get up, and she was pulling me like a sled. We saved our lives and uh, were kind peasants uh, with uh, uh, huge dis uh, dips. And that deep snow, the only mode of transportation was a horse and, and, and a sleigh, uh, uh, pulling the sled. That's how they were moving. And they gave us a ride. And in record time, we made it. To Burka. Now we're coming to Burka, we wait for the, the evening. He comes out, then in kind of recognize my mother. He says, I am Berto's wife. My father's name was Baruch, and the Poles called him. Berko. So he, he was very happy to see us. Asked about my father, but he found out that my father was murdered. He was very upset. She gave him the whole belt. He said, that's, that's yours now. Give her shelter, please. Of course, he said, immediately. I will keep it a secret for my family, he said. He took us into a woodshed. In the woodshed, there was a floor and very expertly was cut out the panel. And under the floor, there was a bunker, similar to the one that we were with the first guy. And he gave us again some uh, straw, kerosene lamp, and a waste bucket, bucket of, for, for human waste. And we stayed there, mind you, with the first guy we stayed about 10 days, and he tried to murder us. And here was a man from the same culture the same religion, Catholic, who endangered himself and his family for almost two years. Can you imagine? How do you explain it? So, uh, we were there, and my mother was ecstatic that we finally found some the, 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 that hole was was uh, covered by uh, by the wood that he cut out. That on top of it, some 
empty bags filled from potatoes and so on, camouflage very nicely. He told us to be very quiet because it's too shallow. He was afraid that I might then make noise. And, uh, you know, people will hear it. Every morning, he used to knock. She gave him, my mother gave him the horrible bucket to empty. And uh, he brought us some food twice, three times a week, enough to survive. But we didn't have air. It was terribly stuffed there. Uh, at night, my mother used to go out, despite what we said not to, to the shed, uh, open the window, Move, told me to walk around quietly, back and forth, to exercise a little bit, and breathe in the, the fresh air. And so it went. Uh, my mother was very worried that I, when we are, we are liberated, and, and, and she always was as optimistic about being liberated, that uh, I will, from inactivity, I will come out uh, liberated as a deficient child. So she, a, a woman, an activist by nature, she, 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 she had to do something about it. So she started telling me stories. Uh, in, into the stories she inserted names of uh, Polish personalities. The Polish per personalities have names which uh, are not easy to remember. Uh, whatever she remembered from her school, Adam Mickiewicz, uh, Henryk Sienkiewicz, everything. And, uh, and so it went. I, I, I myself, uh, uh, I had to listen very carefully, and then the, she tested me on it, and I had to repeat the name. And so it went. I don't know how she didn't lose her mind during these almost two years. One day, and this is the end, it's the winter, end of 44. My mother started acting strangely to me, kind of, she started crying, laughing. We're getting out of here, we're getting out of here, she said. She heard something outside, Russian voices. A lot of shooting, Russian voices. She's getting ready to climb on this little ladder to get out. It is German voices. And so it went back and forth, back and forth. A lot of shooting, a lot of fighting in this area. And then she heard just Russian voices. She decided to get out no matter what. She pushes the lid off, climbs, right? Imagine half of her body is outside above the floor. Four soldiers <coughs> kick in the door, walk in with machine guns into the woodshed. And my mother raised her hands and says, Ibrahim, Ibrahim which means Jews, Jews. One more than that impressed is, is this. He came over, crossed, made a fist, hit her straight in the face, hard on the face. She fell down, back into the hall, took a grenade, wanted to throw it in, but this one of the soldiers put it through his head, 
and said, you are not a murderer, you are a liberator, she's not Jewish. They were, they were looking for Germans and they had orders to kill men, women, children, doesn't matter who. Oh. So he thought we were Germans. But the, the guy who saved our life was a Jew. Now do you know what odds are they for, for, for a Jewish man being from a division of thousands of soldiers, this Jewish man to be in this group of four? It's tremendous. I, I'm not saying that another, if, it, if he wasn't there, the Russian soldier, maybe the other soldier would stop them. But this is speculative. Uh, and we came, the, the Jewish soldier was very nice. He said to us, you were in this hole for almost two years? Don't go out, he said. You'll be blinded by the sun. The sun will be reflecting from the snow. You'll be blinded. Wait here. So she waited in the, this, uh, uh, in the shed. He came back with goggles, uh, and, and with which he rubbed uh, some dirt on them for filtering. And here I am, putting these huge goggles on, and for the first time, coming into the sun. But then I see soldiers, and I start crying. I was told to avoid soldiers as much as possible. They have to kill soldiers. I didn't know what soldiers they were. My mother says, don't cry, don't cry. She looked at me like, surrounded us in a circle. One of them grabbed me, put me on his shoulder, and began to cry. Russians are great dancers and great drinkers. And the soldiers were dancing around. It was like a wild Jewish wedding. You know, dancing, dancing. And I began to enjoy it finally. The doctor of the, of the division came to my mother. They started giving me candy and chocolate and all this. And, and, and said, don't give him anything of, of this, uh, of this uh, child because it will kill him. His body is not useful. Something similar happened to Jewish adult when American soldier liberated death camps, you know. It is quite a, they were walking skeletons. And, and these were young soldiers. They could they felt so sorry for them. They gave them chocolate and they killed them. Uh, so my mother loaded up uh, this avalanche of candy, brought it to the village to distribute to the Polish kids. She was the best known candy woman in the, in the area. Uh, and we were liberated, we went from one DP camp to another. <coughs> we uh, uh, noticed that there were long lists in the DP camp with the names of these who survived and who passed through it, they left their names. So we noticed that, that my grandma survived, <coughs> Uncle Henry. Who, is, uh, uh, who was not in this picture, survived. Uh, another brother, Donek, after liberation, was killed by Ukrainian bandits. Died and bled, bled out in the arms of my grandma. Uh, uh, 
I don't know whether you can see. I later will put it uh, on a table somewhere. This is after the war. You see, I don't look like a girl anymore. I just have a haircut. Okay. And this is Uncle Henry. By the way, Uncle Henry, my grandma, and one of the brothers who got killed uh, were hiding in the woods. And to secure some food, Uncle Henry, were, Henry wasn't begging for it. He was demanding food. And when uh, he was about over six feet tall and had a beard, and he found an axe in, in and he was knocking on the door and demanding food. And seeing the guy who was wild and dead with his axe, most of the time they gave him food. The minute they didn't give him food, he said, you don't want to give me food? I will tell the partisans here that you collaborated with the Germans. They would burn down your property. They gave him food. <laughs> and, and so that was the way to secure sure food with, without relying on the kindness of the heart of, of, of the people. Uh, I was uh, delighted to be liberated. And I was, we moved to a large city because of danger. It was very low as after the war. And, and, and we moved into a city uh, <coughs> called Lodz. After a year, my mother married another uh, Holocaust survivor by the name of Eli Diamond, Yaman. And uh, in Lodz, we moved into a huge tenement. And I couldn't understand why the Polish kids are beating me up, don't want to play with me. I used to come home back and, and I used to hit back, kind of a foolish thing enough, hit back. I used to come home black and blue. Uh, and, uh, but yet, I went out again because the desire to play is after two years of complete isolation. Eventually they got so tired of me that they accepted as, 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 as a group. And then my stepfather found out that uh, some of his family that survived, quite a few of them survived, uh, are now in uh, Israel. So we decided to move to Israel. And when we came to Israel, uh, coming to Israel was an ordeal, it was a horrible ordeal. We, we took a train to Italy, and from Italy, we took a boat to Israel. Under, it's a filthy, warm infested uh, ship. I used to wake up, I had to shake off uh, vermin off from me. Uh, but when we, when we got to Israel, it, it, it looked like I stepped into paradise. It was warm. There were soldiers around, but there were no danger. Danger, they were friendly. My mother took me to the sea, the Mediterranean, nice and warm. It was a pleasure. I had problems adjusting <laughs> to the language, uh, problems learning it. Problems in general adjusting to the culture, 
So I was the oldest uh, guy in the high school. I graduated not at 18, but I graduated at 20. And after graduation, you go straight into the army. And I was shocked that I was accepted into uh, a military unit with active duty in the field because after what I went through. And, and here is uh, my picture of uh, from basic training. It says Killer Constant. Kenji, okay. <laughs> uh, later I, I display it. Now, I, sp I spent uh, two, two and a half years in the army uh, trying to excel as my mother kind of didn't, when I come home, she didn't recognize me kind of. I was very trim, very, very dark. I was stationed in the Negev. Uh, I was stationed, mind you, uh, I'm saying it today because uh, you probably know that recently Topo guy died, and that, that's the famous Israeli actor. Uh, and our family knew Topo, and, and, and because Topol and I served at the same base. <laughs> it's called Mahane Natal, uh, which is south of Beersheba. Uh, Topol had a good job, <coughs> I had a tough job. Topol had a, was blessed with a good boy, so he was in, in the group called Lahakat Nahal. Mm -hmm. Nahal. Uh, that's the sidebar. I, I want to show you also a picture of my granddaughter <laughs> with a machine gun who looks tough like that. Next to <laughs> I am standing next to him. I am 20, she is 18, 19. Okay? Yeah. Okay, she, so my mother used to say, what do they do to you in, in the army? I told her, to try to make me the best soldier I can be to protect me and you, and you from whoever it is. I used to also have nightmare from, from, from what we went through. And uh, I lost the nightmares in the army. Uh, and an encounter with the Prime Minister Ben Gurion, but that's, uh, I don't want to overextend my time, I took enough time. I uh, try to, after the army, I try to work and, and study in Israel, not too successful. So I came to the United States because my parents came to the United States, and I, and I bought <coughs> quite uh, worked out well. To my surprise, I, I, I finished college. Actually, finished also the Jewish Theological Seminary. And uh, I uh, dedicated my time to Jewish education and uh, retired in 2009. I wasn't that happy because I wasn't married. Now, so, the big boss there up there <coughs> felt sorry for the isopole and sent my way a wife from Detroit, Susan, right there. And Susan and I are married 53 years already. Okay, so uh, it was a good shit. And uh, we have eight grandchildren. And two, and one on the way, great-grandchildren. 
Really? Well, I'm losing confidence. <laughs> I, I, uh, and I feel fulfilled and blessed despite the, I must tell you that the, my revenge against Hitler is my large family. And all the kids have blue eyes. <laughs> Hitler must be turning somewhere. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 this is my re revenge. And, and, and they are Orthodox Jews. Uh, my, my daughter, who lives in Teaneck, New Jersey, has three girls and a boy. And my son, who is a rabbi in, in Tel Aviv, has three boys and a girl. <coughs> and I thank you for listening. Thank you. Nobody can tell you that miracles don't happen. Yeah. <laughs> Ja, 
Heim Tennenbaum Sarah Carmel Preinisch Menasche Preilitz Fischel Carmel Schlomo Leiblich Ruf Leiblich Rela Perlmann Jakob Grundmann Kanne Malke Karmel Grundmann Josef Karmel Dr. Blau Oskar Heitz Samuel Hirsch Spanlang Estera Spanlang Marceli Halpern Franziska Halpern Ethel Zilsgarde Finder Renata Strasberg Lia Strasberg Dora Strasberg Marila Stroga Julian Stroga Aram Baitsa Jakob Entrania, Mi Spanlein Dalek Singa Leon Hirstein Anna Hirstein Isser Spielmann Hinda Spielmann Boruch Mordekar Spielmann Branta Spielmann Baruch Mordekar Galitza all those Krakowians that perished here, we don't have their names.
This has been our first of many hybrid presentations we are planning for the future. Thank you to Rabbi Feynman, Cantor Rosner, our guest speaker, Alex Constantine, and those who are present. I hope all who shared this event with us today will continue to share events in the future. We will close our program with the singing of the Pravdazana Lied, which became the anthem of all resistance fighters throughout Eastern Europe. It will be followed by the reciting of Kaddish and the singing of Hatikva. Came on your lust against him that's in bed. When him to fly in it, for shall employ it then. Far from him that no one's eyes give him to show. As well the font on us a drop mit sein in door. Far from him that no one's eyes give him to show. Es wird der Pont und unser Trott mit seinen Tod. Fängt er mit dem Palmenland, ist weißen Land und Stein. Mit seinen Dom, mit unser Pein, mit unser Weih. Und wo gefallen ist, ist ein Spritz von unser Blut. Wird der Sprotz von unser Gur und unser Mut. Von Frau gefallen, es ist ein Spritz von unser Blut. Wer versprotzt uns, ich wurde unser Blut. Es fällt die Morgen zu bagiert in uns dem Heid. Und unsere Nerven werden verschwitten mit dem Feind. Und auch versammeln wird die Sonne in dem Kajor. Wir haben uns auf dem Fenster geblieben und uns da. Und ab vor Sand in der Wiesn und in der Kajo. Wir haben vor uns auf dem Fenster geblieben und uns da. Geschrieben ist das Lied mit Mut und nicht mit Leid. Es ist nicht der Lied von dem Beuger Leute frei. Das hat der Volk zu wäschen, fahre dich gewähnt. Das Lied gesungen mit Neganis in der Hand. Das hat der Volk zu wäschen, fahre dich gewähnt. Das Lied gesungen mit Neganis in der Hand. Der hat so kein Moas, der geht im letzten Weg. Wenn ihm im Leid verstell im Leuten, war komm in Wert noch unser Eisgewend die Schuh. Es wird der Pont und unser Trott mit seinem Dorf. War komm in Wert noch unser Eisgewend die Schuh. Es wird der Pont und unser Trott mit seinem Dorf. Basically, we do not end on a sad note. Even when a Haftorah is talking about bitterness and sadness, they add another paragraph from a different Haftorah which is uplifting. And so we will conclude our commemoration, as we always do, with the singing of Hatikva. Please do join in.
for coming today.